Welcome back to Getting to Know Thyroid. Uh, in the last episode, we got to know thyroid with my endocrinologist, uh, Dr. Seifel here. Dr. Uh, Dr. Seifel is from Glen Eagles, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, profiles in the description. Now, diet and external factors and thyroid, how much does it have to do with each other? External factors like stress and, um, uh, yeah, stress. And how does that affect your bowel? Because we hear about irritable bowel syndrome, uh, tightly linked to thyroid. How would you explain that, Dr. Seifel? Yeah, so um, irritable bowel syndrome is, is more of like a diagnosis of exclusion. So you need to make sure that there's nothing else that can be causing like um, what we call inflammatory bowel disease, uh, celiac disease, or any other structural problems in the bowel. And mm -hmm. IBS, or, or for short, for irritable bowel syndrome, is one of the things that's associated with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, lack of vitamin D, thyroid disorders, a lot of them sort of overlap and, okay. and stress plays a factor in, in all this as well. Um, mm -hmm. but, but an autoimmune part of it is, is important to exclude. So if you have, for example, a, a lack of vitamin D that affects your immune system, that affects your autoantibodies, that can lead to even inflammatory bowel disease or any other autoimmune diseases as well. So they're all mm -hmm. a complex interplay between all the systems in the body, your, your heart, your lungs, your bowels, your skin, your mental faculties. Um, they're all interrelated. Oh, my. So how do you tackle the issue of, uh, you know, keeping your gut healthy? Does it, does it play a part in, you know, improving your thyroid function if your gut is healthy? That's, that's what I'm trying to ask. Okay. Um, not so much. The, the data... Um, the, the link between the two is quite, uh, there's, there's no direct correlation put it as such. There are mm -hmm. associations, but one can't say, let's say if you get your irritable bowel syndrome okay, uh, then there's less risk of thyroid disease. There's no causal relationship as such. There are associative relationships, but not causal. So it's a symptom then. IBS is a, uh, one of the common symptoms of hyperthyroidism, correct? Because uh, yeah. that's what I... Yeah. So it can be misconstrued as mm -hmm. irritable bowel syndrome. A lot of people have IBS for a long time before mm -hmm. a bright spark decides, let's check the thyroid function test. And notably then they notice that there is some element of either overt um, hyperthyroidism or subclinical hyperthyroidism. And that leads to IBS-like symptoms. So where they have this alternating between loose motions, diarrhea, and sometimes mm -hmm. you get a little bit of constipation. Um, mm. If you treat the underlying cause, um, mm. then that it, it should be it should improve. The problem is that a lot of people associate IBS with an actual structural problem in the bowel, and they just right. go to the gastroenterologist, get the camera test, what we call colonoscopy mm. or OGD, and you miss a significant cause, which is the the medical um, biochemical abnormalities, such You're as. Right. The Okay, thanks for putting that in perspective. There's a lot of you know, terms that float around when it comes to you know, thyroid function and your diet and calcium and all that. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, things like calcium. So I'm just going to throw it at you and then you tell me what you think from an endocrine pr uh, perspective. Calcium, I let it out. <laughs> yeah, so um, you have to remember that the thyroid gland, uh, mm -hmm. that butterfly-shaped gland, there are four other small glands on the side. They're mm -hmm. called parathyroid glands. They're the size of a pea. And mm -hmm. that controls the calcium homeostasis in the body. Um, the parathyroid gland uh, secretes a hormone called parathyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. If you have too much of that, your calcium goes up. Okay? I see. Um, calcium by itself, anyway, do does a lot of things. If you have too much of it, it can cause gastritis, a bit of hyperacid to the stomach. It can cause increased risk of bone disease, what we call osteoporosis. It can lead to pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas. It can lead mm -hmm. to formation of kidney stones. You get a lot of pain in the tummy. It can lead to depression. Now, too much calcium by itself, okay? Forget about the overactive parathyroid gland. That has an effect upon the thyroid hormone in your body. So, mm -hmm. um, for example, if you are underactive, thyroid and you're taking thyroxine, right? If you, if you have hypercalcemia or calcium tablets that you take, that calcium tablet will stop the absorption of thyroxine. 
So, so there are ways in which thyroid um, hormone physiology or absorption is affected by calcium intake. So ah, excess so calcium intake uh -huh. at the wrong time is good for the thyroid if you're underactive. So basically, when you have a, a, a hypothyroid, underactive thyroid function, you need to watch out your calcium intake, in other words. Yes. yes. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, so, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, if, no, if, if you're going to take calcium supplements, mm -hmm. right, and, and you feel, gosh, I'm, I don't have enough sunlight exposure, I'm in the house all the time, uh, and, and one is slightly older, postmenopausal, and you're taking the calcium vitamin D supplementation, you've got to make sure you take it four hours after you've taken the thyroid hormone in the morning. So mm -hmm. I tell my patients I take it at night, mm -hmm. um, those multivitamins, so you take it four hours later. If not, the thyroid hormone that you took early in the morning is not going to work. Only ah. less than a you know, significant percentage um, is, is not absorbed properly. Okay, so that, that takes care of calcium. How about iron? What does iron uh, do in the thyroid function sphere? Yeah, so iron is another culprit, uh, a mm -hmm. bit like calcium. Iron and calcium go hand in hand. It's probably the two biggest culprits in stopping the absorption of thyroxine. And, and therefore, if you are anemic and you're known to have iron deficiency, if you have thalassemia and you're iron deficient, you've got to make sure the iron supplements that you take is at least four hours after the, the thyroid hormone that you ingest. How about uh, in not, terms of uh, foods rich in iron, do you need to watch out for that? Um, so in essence, um, the food that one takes, mm -hmm. the, let's say you have it at breakfast, I, I would probably just advise to take it later, that's all. But through the rest of the day, um, the, the thyroxine has already been absorbed into the system in the first mm -hmm. four hours after ingesting it. You can take any foods rich in iron later on. Mm -hmm. So it's fine. You don't have to stop taking iron-rich foods because obviously we need a well-balanced diet, uh, you know, ah. with five portions of vegetables a day anyway. So therefore, it's, it is fine to take an iron-rich food later. Okay. Uh, examples of iron-rich food? If you're vegetarian, it, it might be a little bit more difficult, but spinach um, is, is not that bad. Um, but ideally, you're looking at um, lean cuts of, of uh, meat or um, any of the protein from animal-based protein is pretty good. So whether it's chicken or beef or, you know, that, that would be quite sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Iodine. Yeah. Iodine is probably the elephant in the room uh, when it uh -huh. comes to, to thyroid disease. Um, and and the, the, the richest dietary sources of iodine are things like fish, uh, milk, or mainly fish, I would say, from the seed. So uh, seaweed, and some types mm. of seaweed, what we call kelp, um, dulse, um, certain uh, dairy products, uh, mm -hmm. eggs, but they're not as much, not mm -hmm. as much at all. Um, a certain, um, you know, broccoli or, or cabbage, they, these, these would have a little bit. But I give you an example, you know, like a, a half a pint of milk on average is about mm -hmm. um, roughly what we call 85 micrograms of, of iodine. Um, mm -hmm. but, but that's not as much as, let's say, fish would be. Fish is probably the, or sea fish is uh, probably the, the, the highest source um, of, of iodine per se. So let's say a portion of uh, cod, give an mm -hmm. example. Um, mm -hmm. A portion of cod might be 120 grams of it. That contains 190 micrograms. Mm -hmm. of iodine and that's that's quite a lot of iodine mm -hmm. because as adults our our requirement for iodine is about 150 micrograms sorry i'm going to numbers but you can sense how mm -hmm. how much iodine that would be if you have an overactive thyroid and you take a lot of iodine that iodine is important in, in the incorporation of production of thyroid hormone you need four mm -hmm. iodine molecules to make thyroid hormone, T4. Mm -hmm. uh, you need three of them to make T3, which is the active hormone. So the more you ingest, the higher the risk of the thyroid producing more and more mm -hmm. thyroid. Now, what, what, what is that? that in in, in, in uh, medical world, uh, we call that the wolf Chaikov effect. Um, mm -hmm. the, these two physicians that named this, but essentially you try to reduce your iodine intake if you have an overactive thyroid. 
Um, so, so you could say that iodine, too much iodine can be bad for your thyroid. So let's say you like to eat sushi, right? You want mm -hmm. to eat sushi every day for lunch. And I have a lot of patients who say, should I stop eating sushi? Now, to give an example, uh, in 100 grams of sushi, there's about mm -hmm. nine micrograms of iodine thereabouts, yeah? Um, now, if you're taking the, the, the vegetable sushi, uh, because you've got more seaweed, right? Uh, that's slightly higher, about 20 micrograms compared to the nine on average. So I, I would say, if you want to go for sushi, you got to limit the amount of seaweed um, that's in that sushi because mm -hmm. it has a very high concentration in it. Um, but, but if you want to be really pernickety, right? There are two types of uh, seaweed. There's a the green seaweed that has a low ID compared to the brown seaweed. So mm -hmm. I, oh, I just... Okay. Try and, you try can pick the low, low ID one if you really like sushi. No, no, that, that gives a very good picture for people who want to have it and yeah. uh, want to know how much they can have, you see. So that's a, that's a good picture. Thank you very much. Before I forget, back back to the iodine, the, there's another thing. If you think about the, the brassica family of plants, like you know, mm -hmm. I talked about the broccoli, there's another carpet, the kale. And we actually mm -hmm. published a, a, a case report of somebody who was just eating kale all the time. I and love kale. What's wrong with kale? No, no. Um, I would say that the, the more, more of the seaweed, the kale, and, I and all if you, if you consume that in large amounts, the, the, the iodine itself, as I said earlier, it, it enhances the production of thyroid hormones. So in a sense, over the long term, it can damage the thyroid gland. So mm -hmm. if you consume vast amounts of kelp, um, that, that will lead to that. So it's, it's just a matter of taking it in relatively small amounts. Okay, so we've moved from calcium, iron, iodine to, okay, the role that vitamin D plays in, you know? regulating your thyroid uh and yeah well what, what do you have to say about vitamin d yeah so so vitamin d is a missed um understood kind of vitamin it, actually i would say to the general public it's not a vitamin it's mm -hmm. misnamed as vitamin d it's actually what we call hormone d the proper uh -huh. name is called olecalciferol that that's a the actual scientific name for that and the reason why it's a hormone is because our body actually synthesizes it. It makes it. So when the sun hits the skin, uh, there's an enzymatic process where it's produced. And then it gets, um, what's the right word? Not, it's not just metabolized, but it's activated by the liver and then the kidney. And then it has a huge amount of effect in the body. Mm -hmm. A bit like thyroid hormone. Because, you know, vitamin D is a hormone. So it affects your bone metabolism. So it affects mm -hmm. how strong your bones are. So if you don't have enough vitamin D, your bones will not be as strong. It'll be a bit looser and high risk of fractures because it's not metabolized or strengthening the bones. The most important thing about vitamin D, in our case, talking about thyroid, is that it affects the immune system. Right. Now, the, the two things here. One, if you think about the pandemic that we're facing currently anyway, um, with, with COVID-19 and, and we're all aware of the, the repercussions of that. If you don't have enough vitamin D, mm -hmm. your immune system you, becomes more rogue, right? You have more autoimmunity. You have a high risk of autoimmune antibodies attacking the body. So that's why right. with COVID, you have high risk of those studies done in, in the ICU in America, which showed there's an increased risk of autoimmune effects on the lungs and, and, and high risk of death uh, with mm -hmm. this. It's the same thing when it comes to thyroid, you have a high risk of your antibody attacking the thyroid, your thyroid receptor antibody. So the, the idea is um, you've got to replenish your vitamin D. Now, right. th there are a lot of tenuous connections, right? Um, but, but this is the one that there's a lot of research going into it. And, and I think it's safe to say, if your vitamin D level is low, you've got thyroid disease, please take adequate vitamin D supplementation. That's what I give to all my patients. Including me. <laughs> I was on it too. So uh, to a normal person, um, you said, I think I heard you say at, at the clinic that, you know, it's very common for, especially now during the pandemic, to be, uh, to be slightly low on the hormone D level. Uh, do you think that's the case with a normal person? Do they need to take supplements, you think? Yes. Yeah. So my, my colleague and I, uh, we, we looked at the data and mm -hmm. actually in Malaysia, there's mm -hmm. more than 80% of patients 
they come to hospital for any condition. And uh, when we check the vitamin D, they are vitamin D deficient. It's right. all because we live in an urban or many suburban kind of centers. Yes. And, and we're all indoors, like you and I right now. We, we're not spending much time enough. out there in the sun. Right. And, and therefore, we inherit. We're not like before where we used to be farmers or fishermen or, you know, work out more. We don't. That, that's, you know, the progress of society as such. And so therefore, with this pandemic that we're facing at the moment, I would implore that just to keep ourselves um, safer, you know, mm -hmm. and there are ongoing studies in the UK at the moment to look at whether providing vitamin D supplementation mm -hmm. will improve outcomes in ICU for patients who have severe COVID, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but at the moment, it's better to be on it than not to be on it, just to be on the safe side. Yeah, you're taking vitamin D, for example, and you're not on thyroid meds like me. So for a normal person, if you say, I, I want to go to the pharmacy right now to get some, what is the dosage you would um, suggest? Yeah, so uh, for uh, the, the different dosages depending on, on uh, one's ethnicity. So Caucasians <laughs> actually, and, and, and on the basis of the data that's come predominantly more from the Northern Hemisphere, uh, mm -hmm. but 800 units should be sufficient. But what I found right. is in Malaysia, that's definitely not enough. Uh, How was it? Of our society needs at least double that, which is 1,600 to maybe up to 3,000 units a day. Because uh, we tend to be hugely more um, deficient in vitamin D. If I look at my patient cohort, most of uh -huh. vitamin D is like 20, yeah. 5, 19. Um, mm -hmm. Even when I checked mine, mine was 9. When in oh. fact, yeah, it should be like 100. Oh. And, and, but the Caucasian population, their vitamin D levels are more sort of the insufficient levels, uh, mm -hmm. which is quite surprising. But the lack of vitamin D or hormone D leads to seasonal affective disorder. You just feel low and depressed and sad and, 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 and tired. Really. Yeah. Uh, to, give, to give you an example, it's kind of like, you know, the one time when I traveled to cold country and it was winter and it got dark at 3 p.m., I remember, and I couldn't. And I told you the story before. Uh, I couldn't understand why I was so depressed. In fact, I wasn't depressed at all. It's just because I wasn't getting enough sunlight because by 3 p.m. it's dark. So yeah. that's kind of like a picture of what vitamin D does to you. Okay, yeah. all, all those out of the way already. Um, just to add to it, if you're going through the same thing as I am, now that I'm pregnant, do all these things um, still play a part? Like, do I need to watch my ID intake, my iron, and no, 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 you know? I, I think that that's a great question. And to be on the safe side, um, mm -hmm. if, if let's say the thyroid disease is stable, mm -hmm. um, yes, I mean, you can have too much iodine. And in, in a sense, excessive iodine intake should be avoided because it, it may damage your thyroid, but also the pregnancy. Because so, you have to remember, when you have too much iodine, it mm -hmm. incorporates into the thyroid hormone and we have too much thyroid hormone in the early part of the pregnancy, in the first trimester anyway, there's a high risk of premature miscarriage or abortion. Um, as see. the pregnancy progresses, if you have too much iodine and the thyroid hormone goes up, it may affect your blood pressure. So you have a high risk of things like preeclampsia, complications of, of pregnancy where your blood pressure goes up and it affects um, your kidneys where you lose too much protein. Um, mm -hmm that may affect how the pregnancy progresses. It mm -hmm. may affect the baby as well, because if you have too much side of hormone, it sets in motion a, a whole lot of cascade in terms of autoimmunity, and whether you have uh, increased thyroid receptor antibodies that may pass along to, these, these antibodies may pass along to the baby. Um, usually what we would say is that uh, the recommendations for anybody who have no history of thyroid disorders is that for three months prior to pregnancy or even during the pregnancy, you should just ensure adequate uh, iodine intake, but not too much. But for, for patients who have pre-existing uh, thyroid disease, um, whether mm -hmm. it's being overactive or, or should I say underactive, again, uh, preconception, it's important that um, in the first trimester, uh, if, if you're underactive, you may need a, a little bit more extra dose of thyroxine. So therefore, having a little bit more thyroid, uh, sorry, ID may be beneficial. So normally, if you're underactive, we usually increase the thyroid hormone by 20 to 30%, for example. So if you're on 100 micrograms, 
you take um, 25 micrograms extra, like 125, and slightly mm. more iodine intake. If you're overactive thyroid, uh, the beautiful thing about overactive thyroid, when you get pregnant, it actually stabilizes. And, and don't try and exacerbate that by taking too much mm. iodine. Understand. Okay, so uh, that part's taken care of. But there was a lot of talk about anti-inflammatory diet. Does that help regulate at all? Because there, was, uh, there are some doctors who say, okay, go on an anti-inflammatory diet and it should help you with your thyroid function. What is your view on that? Uh, because the data is so sparse and, and mm -hmm. no uh, sort of self-respecting pharmaceutical industry would pay a lot of money to do research on this. So in other words, a lot of this is anecdotal. Uh, so a lot right. of this is theoretical. So we, we don't actually have um, a statement guidelines from um, the, the thyroid uh, foundations or, you know, uh, to recommend one way or another regarding anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. diet. So I'm going to set that out and say, actually, <laughs> because of lack of evidence, it's right. difficult to recommend one way or another. Fair enough. But I mean, on a normal level, even if I don't have thyroid anyway, I, from what I research, anti-inflammatory is just overall good for your health. Would you say yes to that? I, I mean, think the, the, the beneficial effect of anti-inflammatory diet is probably just sub-physiological. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't have a supra-physiological or a pharmacological effect. So mm -hmm. um, yes, of course, there, there are certain benefits, but it doesn't overreach into uh, a benefit that one would say is, is supra-physiological or, or similar to what taking a medication would be. So it's just a part, but it, it would be beneficial to that extent only. So on, on, on layman terms, an anti-inflammatory diet will not cure my thyroid, but it no. probably will make me feel better because I'm eating less processed. You yeah. know, overall, you know, my body will feel better, but it has nothing to do with thyroid. Yeah. Okay. We made that clear. <laughs> when we come back in the next episode, and if you have any questions, put it in the you know, uh, comments below. But in the next episode, we'll talk about uh, options for a thyroid. There are three surgery options, uh, I mean, su surgery options, uh, as far as I know, then I'll ask doctor about that and, uh, you know, medication or maybe the more uh, natural route, maybe your opinion on that. That will be the next episode. For now, thank you very much for the diet.